Hello there, Pursuing Freedom friends. Thanks, as always, for being with us today. I'm super excited to introduce you today to Ruben Garcia. Ruben is already blowing my mind before we've even started recording this podcast. So I'm just so excited to dive in. He's been in real estate for about five and a half years. He's with EXP currently, and he's got over 55 agents on his team in the North Carolina region and agents, some of them all over the States. And he is developing a system that is creating consistent, intentional, yet organic lead generation by referral through his database for his entire growing team. And he's also a real estate investor and, and, and I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm just going to bring Ruben on to tell us a little bit about himself. Ruben, thanks for being here today. What's up, everybody? How are you? Super excited to have you here. So um, we always start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your journey into real estate, through real estate up to today, and then we'll kind of roll from there. Okay. And then stop me anytime that you feel like, you know what? They need to hear more. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. All right. I was at UPS, did UPS for about 12 years, almost 12 years. And about two years before I finally quit, I was just talking to some of the drivers and, and some of the higher ups because they wanted me to become like management and all that. And I was like, man, tell me about your home life. Tell me about, is this worth it? Talk to me a little bit about that. Because if I'm going to dedicate my whole life to this thing, I need to make sure that it's going to be a good like ROI. Right. And they said, Ugh, it is. it hurts. It hurts the family life. You could just go ahead and just say, screw seeing your family during Christmas time. And I love Christmas time. And I love cookies, and, you know? And, and it was just like, it took me two years to hear that. Hear that, hear that. Because I'm at a job where I get great pension, good pay. Uh, I don't know what else, stock, stock options. Like you get a great insurance. I mean, the whole thing. So for me to quit means I start over 12 years in the game. So it took two years. Two years until finally I said, man, there has to be something else. And I had someone say that you need to be in sales. I'm pointing at them as if they're sitting next to me. They are not. Uh, but I, they said, man, you should sell phones. And I was like, man, I don't know if I should sell phones. They were like, what about cars? I was like, I like cars, but I don't know if I should sell cars. I said, man, if I'm going to sell something, I bet, I bet I could do a pretty good job of selling the biggest thing I can think of that I could sell, which is a house. And that's what started it. I, you know, I had no passion for real estate. Um, it was just an exit strategy out of UPS. That's all it was. Um, so I went and then I found out the, the low barrier entry, right? It's like 500 bucks for a class. That's not college for years and years and years. That's mm. what 70, 90 hours, depending where you're at for 500 bucks. So that's, that's what got me into real estate. So talk to me about taking the leap then. Were you already married with kids when you took the leap? No, I was single and I was a single father. I was raising my daughter since she was three weeks old. So Whoa. a lot of people did not agree with my decision. That I was told, don't do it. How could you do that to your daughter? How could you do that to you? Like the whole thing. But I, but I just felt, I mean, I couldn't, I guess I didn't see it at the time, but definitely I see it so much now that I can't align my goals with other people's vision, right? If it's not a vision that's going to excel or multiply my life or my family's life or the people that I love or my vision, then what is the point? And I'm glad I saw it then, uh, although it took two years to hear that, you know, but eventually I just, I said, you know what? My daughter was too young to even remember this conversation, but I told her, I was like, hey, give me two years, two years of struggling, two years of eating the worst stuff ever, you know, two years of this, two years of that. And then I promise we'll be in a better place. That's how long in my mind real estate was going to take before we were stable. So no, I wasn't married. I was single, single father. So. Okay. A couple things that I want to touch on before we go further is that I love how you talked about that. Um, what you felt is, was kind of what ultimately allowed you to push through your thoughts, right? And everybody else's thoughts. That's a lot of noise to have to push through when we already have our own thoughts and our own limiting beliefs and our own fears. And then when you have other people discouraging you from what your heart is telling you to be able to listen to that, no wonder it took two years. And for some people, they'll just settle for life. You know, they just settle there and and suck it up essentially. So, um, and I love how you said that you weren't willing to al align your goals with other people's vision. So Talk to us about what it looked like then. So you told yourself and your daughter that it was going to take two years, but what did it, what actually happened once you went full steam ahead into real estate? 
Yeah. So I'll just jump on the vision part and then I'm going to jump straight into that. Cause with the vision part, their vision is okay. Right. It's okay. I'm not dogging their vision. Their vision was okay with them, but the retirement option didn't fit with me. And so it's not a bad vision. It just, it wasn't a vision that aligned with me. I love those guys. Wasn't a vision that really aligned with what I, I thought I could do. So, uh, so I said two years, well, cool thing. It took 10 months for me to quit UPS. It didn't take two years. It didn't even take a year. It took 10 months. Um, and which was scary to put in that two weeks notice. I was hyped and I was terrified at the same time. Matter of fact, this poster, that's so funny that you bring that this poster right here I ordered and it's got all, it's got all kind of, for people who are listening, it's just got a bunch of, uh, quotes and motivational things on it. And I ordered it, uh, before I quit, didn't even know I was about to quit. I'll tell you what gave me the sign to quit. But I ordered it, and the day that it came in was the day that I put in my two weeks notice. And on there, it says, if you don't like your job, quit. Wow. It's the same day it came in. And I was like, mind blown, because at that time, I hired a coach at $500 a month, I think. They were on a credit card. I just did what I, I felt like that was what I needed to do. The people I surrounded myself were. Uh, you know, align their self with coaches and consultants. So I did it. I took that step and I did it. I invested in myself. And that coach said, Hey, listen, when you set up reserves of six months in your bank account, will you jump? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I will. But that was when I first started. And then when it got down to it, I was terrified, man, but I get, I kept to my word. And that's when that poster came in the same day I hit that, that reserve and everything aligned and the universe was like, dude, jump jump that to every I'm, I'm telling you to jump right now if you don't jump that's on you i'm giving you all the signs right now so well i need jump. to ask because i mean that's not a small thing to say that it took me 10 months to have six months reserves in my bank account so what did it look like what did your coaches advise what was it that resonated with you and propelled you into the action that it requires to get that kind of momentum so quickly in this difficult business that we're in it's a great question. So I will say the six month reserve isn't, wouldn't be my six month reserve now. Back then my, uh, I was buying a house, but I bought it at a foreclosure. So the house didn't really have a lot. It was a less than a thousand square foot, but it was 350 bucks a month for the whole thing. Uh, you know, the, the principal insurance taxes and, uh, interest, like the whole thing was 350. So the costs were way low. So it, it was able, it was, I was able to save up a lot faster. Okay. So there's that. But what did I have to do? Man, I realized more than ever that information can be so negative. And what I mean by that is like the radio. What I mean by that is the TV. What I mean by that is your, in, the, your circle of influence, right? And so what I did was I just cut. I just started cutting everything out of my life. Every TV in my house had a picture on it or a quote on it of something of motivation. And I would tape it on it. Basically to say, dude, you want to turn on the TV or do you want to hit your goals? Right? So all TV was done, canceled uh, uh, cable so we could save a little bit more income to hit reserve faster. Every clock in the house had time to work written on it on permanent marker. Like I was in, I was in make it or break it back against the wall mode. Nothing was going to stop me but myself. And I just didn't allow myself to have enough negative internal conversation to stop me. I'm just kind of speechless because... <laughs> I mean, to render me speechless <laughs> is really hard, okay, Ruben? Like, anyone who knows me knows that it's not, it's pretty tough. That was really, yes. that was kind of like drop the mic. I don't know where to go from here. Like, wow. And, you know, yesterday I was talking with uh, some of my coaching clients and we were talking about fear and this idea that, um, actually, I think I brought it up this morning on the class. Maybe that's why it's top of mind. But the thing is, like, you had fear. You you said you were terrified and you were like full steam ahead, jazz, back against the wall, balls to the wall, whatever you want to call it. But you were terrified. And the thing is that what you just said to many listeners is probably really admirable. Like people are probably like, wow, that blows my mind. And they're all rendered speechless like I am. But the, but the thing that I think is important for people to take away is that it wasn't that you didn't have fear. It was that you decided to act in spite of your fear over and over and over again in the most extreme way possible by graffitiing your house. <laughs> Big time. It was everywhere. I mean, it, it got to the point to where it was like all the mirrors too, by the way, all the mirrors had it. It got to the point to where I even put up a picture above. I don't even know if I ever said this. I put a picture 
above my light switch before I would exit my room. And it said something like, your daughter needs you or do this for your daughter or something like that. So every time I even left my room, I would see that. When I was laying down in bed, I had my affirmations taped above my head like they'd come alive when I was dreaming. Um, I mean, I had my goal board. I had a whiteboard drilled into my bedroom wall. And I, every day I would go in there and I'd put how many people I talked to, where did they come from? I mean, it was a, it, I was so drowned into leaving UPS and creating this thing, this other thing that I had everything in my life that reminded me that I had to make it. Even in my car, I tell people this, in my uh, uh, cup holder, I had a, I would have a bottle in there and I'd pretend it was a stick shift to a Ferrari and it was an old beat up Crown Vic. Um, but I mean, I had to, I didn't know it then, then, but it is that framework of be, do, have, right? I had to be that. I had to be that before I could do it. And I just had to be in that mindset that that's where I was going. That's where I was moving forward to. So yeah, I graffitied the house and the cars. That's amazing. Well, it's interesting because you talk about be, do, have, and there's another really awesome quote that's, um, in order to become a millionaire, you must first believe you can be and then begin acting like one. Mm -hmm. And so that's like the do part of it, right? Like first it's like, Mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to be, then I'm going to like do something about it. Even, and it was funny because I I interviewed someone on the podcast, um, Gwen Dobbenmeyer, and she talked a lot about how, you know, your coach might instill in you a belief that you can't see. So you just have to trust that if they say that if you do this, you will get these results or you can have this life. And she talked about just like hitting the button for like belief and then just go like Mm -hmm. Ninja Warriors, just run up and just like slam the button and then go just act. Yeah. So that's really cool. And you know, it's, it's also cool because anyone who's listening, regardless of where anyone is in their journey, they can adapt any portion or all of what you've done there and just put those goals in front of you in every way possible so that you can't ignore what your heart is telling you. Yeah, because I'm not a, I'm telling you guys, I know this is going to, I'm not a smart guy. Like, I don't see myself as a smart guy, but I, I could put in work, but everybody could put in work. So it's not, it's not like a light of ray shined on just me to make, and I'm not made it, but it's like, it's not just for me, it's for everybody. You know, you just have to put in the work. I will say I was blessed by honestly being single and not, when I was cutting people out of my life, at least, and this is going to sound bad. I hope this doesn't sound too bad. At least I didn't, I wasn't in bed with someone who didn't believe in my goals. Right. And I have to even fight that. Not saying, you know, that's a big thing in a lot of people's lives, but I think I was kind of blessed in, in an area, right? Like I made my, my atmosphere and my environment in my house and in my car and no one could stop me. Yeah, that's huge. So talk to me a little bit. Sounds like you're an implementer, right? And so I want to learn a little bit about it. A, you know, what kind of mentorship were you receiving and what kind of instruction were you receiving and how did that work out for you in the way of implementation? And then how's that translated to what you're creating now? Because you've got some incredible systems in place to support this massively, very rapidly growing, amazing organization. So talk to me about those early years of like guidance and implementation and how that carried on to where you're at today. Yeah, I think what she did was she squeezed time for me, by the way, like obviously 10 months. So what she did was she not only built in systems, she, again, made me believe the system. Right. So I just executed. That's all I did. She aligned those things for me. She made me track my goals. Uh, She made me track how many people I talked to. What were the conversions from talk to to actually appointment set to appointment set to like she made me track everything. Hence the whiteboard. Um which brought clarity because the numbers brought clarity on the things I needed to focus on. So I started that super early. Uh, And also, honestly, a plan because I could have said I was going to quit, but she gave me the finish, well, kind of a finish line. So once I pass that line, I either pull the trigger or not. You either work with me or her, This I'm her. You either work with me or you don't. You said you would. If you're not going to, that's fine, but you and I are no longer a good fit, right? She's like hardcore and I, I... I just dig that. And, and as soon as I hit that finish line, I stuck to my word and I did that. So I guess what she did is she built in a goal, a system, and accountability of once I hit a certain metric, I was going to do what I said I was going to do. Okay. So first of all, I love that you talked about tracking and clarity. 
Um, and I, I always joke how embarrassing it is that I didn't start tracking until like 12 years into my journey. And the clarity is that, I mean, the crazy thing is that we make things so much harder than they need to be. Mm-hmm. And we work harder and longer than we need to longer hours, more effort, more time mm-hmm. wasting. And when you track, you can't, there's no, the numbers don't lie. And so that clarity creates, there's a science. When I do this, this, I get this result. And I, I, mm-hmm. I mean, that's impressive that you implemented that so early on. Um, and then the other thing I'm talking about, she helped you with a goal and a system. The thing is like, have you ever heard that saying that a goal without a plan is just a wish? Yeah. So like, we all have wishes that reside deep, deep in our heart. And as soon as they start coming out and you try to give it a voice, then we have thoughts and limiting beliefs and negativity that just squash the wishes in our heart. So it's like any wish you have deep down inside could be available to you as a tangible goal as long as you put a plan in place on how to get there even if Mm -hmm. you don't know how yet yeah correct i mean for me uh, this saying ended up coming out later which aligned with who i was in that moment was if your why is big enough the how doesn't matter and and that's where i was at my why was big enough like i could care oh i gotta track this okay got it oh i gotta go do that okay got oh i gotta talk to 100 people who leave harris teeter in one day got it like I was good. It didn't make sense for me to make an excuse on why I couldn't do something in that moment and where I was at. The why was big enough. The that how was didn't matter. So powerful though. They, you couldn't make an excuse. Like, yeah, that's huge because there are a lot of excuses. And the fact that you're saying I couldn't make an excuse is huge. Um, all right. Talk to me a little bit about your, now your business is taking off. Okay. Where you were five and a half years ago. And even in those first 10 months to where you are today with 55 agents is a, that's a pretty big trajectory in a short amount of time. So I want to start first with the beginning. You asked the, the, your mentors or peers at your former job about what it would look like to continue on that career path. And your question was in regards to home life. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about how you maintained mm. a semblance of home life when real estate starts creeping in and getting busy and mm-hmm. you start to feel pulled and tugged in a million different directions. Well, how did you continue to honor both the growth of your business and hitting those goals and your home life? Uh, I can start from what I first did to where I'm at now. So what I first did was I just was present when I needed to be. And then when everyone hit the sack, I got to work. So I would work till three, four in the morning and be back up at six. But again, my why was big enough that the how didn't, I could care less. I, in my office, people would give me toothpicks and it was a joke because they would say, that's how I needed to hold up my eyelids because I never slept, but I didn't care that I never slept. They did. They were like, you're going to, you know, but this is another outside influence. Look, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your body. You're going to hurt your mind. I'm like, do whatever it takes right now. So, um, I, that's, that used to be my plan. But that's how I balanced it. I would just spend time with them. But when everyone hit the sack, I worked. And I just worked until I was done. Um, it was just a very hard work method. And then I'd wake up, do it all over again. Now it's different. <laughs> now what I've done is I've gotten very, very, and anybody who knows me is, knows where I'm going with this, but I've gotten very, very strategic with my calendar. And I block everything, legit, everything in my calendar. Um, starting off with home. So it's family. It's uh, family nights, it's date night, it's hobbies, it's exercise, it's what else? I got a whole list of things that have to be plugged into your calendar first, which is all personal. And then what it does is it exposes all the time that you can spend in business. And we'll find that we have a lot more time. It's just we try to put different priorities in there because we don't want to do it. Uh, but we do have a lot of time that we do business. So now I just follow my calendar. That's it. My calendar is in control of my life, which I love. Right. So you were on the the class this morning with Shelby Osborne, correct? I was and I wasn't. Okay. So I was, I turned it up, but I was on daddy duty. So my question for you is, how do you feel based on the fact that you just said that you time block and you time block personal first? Yes. Do you feel that you are owned by your emails and owned by the reactive aspect of our business? Or do you feel like you're in control of when you 
check your emails, check your text, check your social media, turn on, turn off. Is it an on and off button that you have when you're time blocking? Or is it just to say like, this is the time that I'm exercising, this is the time that I'm with my kids, but if something comes up, I'm still plugged in and checking my emails. I'm just curious. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think both. I think 80 to 90% hard cut and I'm okay with it. Like I'm in complete control. Um, the, like right now, if I were to pick, keep picking up my phone and keep checking my phone, completely not in control, none of this is going to kill me, but I've built the business enough where I have people that are handling what's jumping into my world right now. So I don't have to deal with it. When I say it's both, it could be that like right now we have an investment property under contract and we're just trying to get this bad boy to the closing table because it's been very creative and fun and fun. So just handling anything that happens there, we may need to jump on it right away. Um, but 90, 80, 90% of the time, absolutely. I, I'm a hard cut guy. And people know that. I don't even pick up my phone. Anybody who calls is immediately rejected. And they're rejected with one of three text messages. And what I found by doing that years ago when I was... Because I did this when I was CEO of Keller Williams Fayetteville too. It does a few things. One, the person will find out the problem right away because they don't want to wait on you. But their instinctual reaction is just to reach out to you. Well, most of the time they can find out the answer on themselves. So you're teaching them to find the answer themselves, number one. Number two, they're going to text me exactly what they're looking for, right? So I don't have to spend time, not, I love everybody, but I don't have to spend 15 minutes on how's the weather. When you finally ask me for what you need, they just text me what they need. And either someone else can handle it or I can handle it. So I found all these little strategies to kind of cut that, cut the noise out. That doesn't, that doesn't help us all progress. So this is really powerful and fascinating to me because we talked earlier about excuses and you know, how many people do you know and mentor that make an excuse for why they're overconnected and overcommitted all the time and not prioritizing the way you are? Uh, probably all of them in the very beginning, but you know, I hit the point where it's, it's, we've created a system strong enough that that's no longer an excuse or they're just not executing on the system. And if they're not executing on the system, their why is not big enough, right? So who, when you, your first mentorship was in getting off the ground, launching, okay? Then you had to be able to put systems in place and then you started to scale. How soon into your journey as a 100% commission licensed realtor did you start having the vision that you've now executed on? Uh, Probably... 10 months to a year in, um, my first, our first year in the business, we created, I helped create a team to do a little over 12 million in production this first year. And then six months after that, I became the CEO of Keller Williams Fayetteville. So only a year and a half as being an agent, we ha- I had 130 agents and we had a, a solid, solid team at that office. Uh, but I was already feeling, man, I want to get out. I want to get more in front of people and I want to empower people. I want to help people grow. So we grew a team. So I li- I didn't live that individual real estate life for long till we just helped grow this team environment its first year, then just overall team of the whole office in a year and a half. So talk to me a little bit about the difference between your journey as an agent attracting clients versus the journey as a leader attracting agents. How are those, how is that similar or different? I mean, do you, I mean, I I feel like across the board, it's all about giving value. And if you're passionate about helping and serving the lives of everyone you meet, that's how you attracted the clients. And it's also why agents are drawn to be a part of your team because they want to absorb what you have to put out there. Yes. Yes. I answered (laughs) the question for you. Okay. Then let's, I want to skip now. I want to marry these two things. So, because we talked about this before we started recording, but what I'm impressed by is that you have a very, very organized model for touching those people in your database and building your business by referral. And a lot of people, I think, feel like lead generation, automation, delegation, it loses its personal touch, but you've created a model that works. So can you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah. So, I mean, I still agree with, with that. The way we've created the business, if I die, the business keeps running right now on the sales side. Truth be told, if I die, it's just not going to have the same flavor that I have thrown at those people because it's not me. 
So I get over that. That's it, right? Like, yeah. of course, it's not going to be me, but that's okay. Are they serviced? Are they, are, here's the deal, like Chick-fil-A, right? If the Chick-fil-A owner does the Chick-fil-A owner walk in every Chick-fil-A and flip the burgers and, or chicken sandwiches, sorry, chicken sandwiches, uh, answer the, the, uh, the window and doing the cash. No, they don't do any of that. All they've done is created a super high standard that people have to run. And what you'll find is that people are attracted to more of your high standard than they are of you. And if you can, if you can implement that high standard, that puts you in a position to delegate, to elevate. So, oh man, I just went on a tangent there. What was I saying? Oh yes. So creating the the follow up system is something that we've done. Is that anybody who goes into our data number one, a contact is three things for us, which is database. You got to add them to a database, our database, notes, and then a follow up. That's it. If we could do those three things, we're in a solid place. We set that up, then we run a seven days of pain. It's pleasurable, but we call it seven days of pain back in the day. And it just stuck. So we're reaching out seven days a row till they finally reach. They talk back to us. Once they talk back to us, we put them on what's called an eight by eight or a six by six, which is talking to them once a week for the next eight weeks or the next six weeks, um, depending on who this person is. And we may not touch them all every week for the next six to eight weeks. Again, depending on who the person is. By week six, we finally ask for business. So we deliver value for more than a month and a half of just giving, 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 giving before we even hint on asking for business. Um, and then after that, we're just, uh, we're, we're staying in communication with them, their family, their dog, whatever, for the next, uh, or for their whole life, every two to three months, we're reaching back out. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a drip campaign, but there's a way that we've created it to where we keep the relationship going through what they've told us on the last conversation that we just bring back up and how can we deliver value through that? That's it. Now, the question I have for you is, do you have one person implementing this or do you have a number of people with the implementing? I mean, is it the agents that are doing this, this six by six and the eight by eight? Or is it Oops. another team member that's in the office? So right now I'm doing it because... So I'm doing it and I have the wife seeing how it runs in case I die. Um, I'm doing it and it takes about two hours a day in the morning from seven to nine o'clock to get that part done. The rest is handled by other agents, attorneys, lenders, whatever on the other side. So the communication on my part is two hours a day because we're, we just started creating this about six or seven months ago. Um, and it's growing faster than we thought it would. It was a beta test. We were just seeing what we could do with this thing. Um, so I'm still in that driver's seat for two hours, but after that, the rest of it is, is being taken care of and the driver's seat could be anywhere, right? I could be anywhere and run that, run that business. Awesome. And then are these phone calls or texts? No. Yes. So they're all text 99.99% or text messages because I need leverage. I need leverage. So I, I need leverage, but also what we find is that by calling people, that people aren't or don't like being interrupted on the time that they're spending with whatever it is. We're, we're kind of hacking their time. And what we found is that people don't, the people that we're reaching out to don't really enjoy that. So with a text message, they can answer on their own time. And so we've seen more feedback that way. We run conversions about two to one, meaning every two people we reach out to, one of those reach back out to us. Okay. And then we're running to right now a 12 to one, but a 12 to one that if we talk to 12 people, then we're setting one appointment, right? So uh, it's all text messages, but the text messages work for us on our end because we can, we can touch 50, 70 plus people a day. And at the same time, they can answer us when they want to answer us. Amazing. Um, what I love about this and what I'm hearing um, and what I imagine the list, some of the listeners might be thinking is that it's extremely disciplined. and some of us are not as disciplined or maybe we're not, um, we make excuses for why we haven't been able to sustain this level of consistency. But what I'm hearing is actually simplicity. You very quickly and easily rattled off your game plan for success. You have written the rules, you beta tested it, you see it's working, and now it's very black and white. This is what I do during these hours of the day. This is what it looks like. This is what the follow-up looks like. That level of simplicity plus consistency is what gets you the results. And it is, I mean, I would imagine that that 
that level of simplicity of like, these are the rules we've written and everybody's going to follow the rules is probably liberating because it's easy to measure, right? Yes. And I tell anybody and everybody who works with me, here's how we've done it to hit that goal. And tell me where the gaps are at. Tell me where we could do better. Like, yes, it's, it's written now, but the reason we moved to text messages is because we started to find that calls weren't doing it. Emails weren't doing it. So we didn't stay so rigid. It was like, this is how it is, period. I love feedback. I love to break it. I love to break the system because the better, the more we break the system, the more creative we're being. So, and trying to figure out new ways to do it. So yes, it definitely 1000% is simple. I need it to be simple. My brain's like super small. Um, and it, it's just easy to run. And I want to hear feedback. I want to know where we can improve. I, I, that's what is going to help us scale to the next uh, level. And I want people to feel like they have a voice that work with me, that it counts to speak up and go against the grain. I love it. And I, you know, I, I also think a lot of people think, well, uh, someday I'm going to do that. Someday I'm going to put a system in place. I'm just so busy. I'm so busy. But the reality is that when you do what you said your coach helped you do, which was squeeze time by putting just little systems in place, little rules, you're creating more time for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not having to feel a compulsion to be always doing, always checking, have I done enough? Because you've done enough because you created a system. Mm, correct. And so how do you find it with, you know, you have a really large team. Um, how do you advise folks that seem like, you know, that give you that feedback of, well, I'm so busy. I haven't had time to yeah. put those systems in place. I say, cool. Let me see your calendar. Yeah. That's it. That's my go-to every time. And they're like, well, well, I don't want to show you. Well, if I show you, you know, there's a bunch of holes and gaps. Well, and it's like, okay, get your calendar straight. And then you can tell me that you can't tell me you don't have time. If you're not tracking it, you can't tell me you have time. If you're not holding time accountable, right? Like don't, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, it's like saying that you have no food, but you've not yet checked your pantry, right? Like, yeah. Tell me you don't have time, but haven't checked your calendar. Now, nah, let me see you structure, structure out your calendar first. And then you can come and tell me that till then. Let me see your calendar. My God, I love it. This is so amazing. Um, I also am always really impressed by anyone like you that like the level of discipline and systems and structure, um, because as a person who um, evaded it and found myself thinking that if I add more structure, if I add more systems, I'm going to feel more suffocated. And then finally embracing it and realizing that the freedom that comes as a result of having everything really crystal clear and predictable I mean, that's the key is like you're creating predictable growth in your business. It's helping you attract team members. It's helping you have attract clients. And it's, I mean, yeah, I'm just like, woo, yeah. blown away. Well, that's, so what you said was all business, right? And you're exactly right. A hundred percent. And that was it do for your personal life, right? So we know, like I say, we, my wife and I, we know when date night is. We know like next week, Tuesday through Thursday, we're hitting the beach. Like it's so, it's so liberating and you build in enough confidence in your relationship when you do it on your personal life too. Your kids, if you have young kids, when you have family night, when you have game night, when you have movie night, you better believe they're going to hold you accountable to being there, which puts you into an accountable seat to be the best parent you can in that moment and be present. So it, it does, it's just a whole life structure. I mean, yep. it just so happens to do really well in business as well. Well, it's, the thing is that you've designed your business to support the lifestyle vision. That's literally the whole premise of pursuing freedom is like creating the yeah. life you don't need a vacation from. And you can't do that without getting organized and also getting clear on what the heck you want. And then saying, I'm willing to prioritize this and put boundaries around it first. When you go on vacation, do you just get up and go? You plan that vacation. You got to plan it. And it takes work. It yeah. takes work to plan out the vacation and pack the right food and pack the right clothes. And do, did we bring our kid? Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, there's so much planning and preparation before you actually enjoy vacation. So it's still work up front. Yeah. I love it. Well, if folks want to find you, follow you, what's the best way? Proven by Ruben on every platform ever. So uh, LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Instagram mostly though, if you really want to hit me up, Instagram and Facebook, I could say both, Instagram and Facebook. But all of the platforms hit me up on Proven by Ruben. You'll be able to find me, ask me questions. Let's do it. 
I love it. Well, I appreciate that you're willing to share your story and that your mission is to impact the lives of so many people. And I have no doubt that you've already done so and you're going to continue to do so. So I'm excited to Thank watch you. your journey. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope your, I hope your audience got some, some clarity and some value. If not, tell me. Reach back out on one of those platforms like, you didn't do enough for me. Tell me where I messed up so that way I could do better. There's no question that you just gained a million followers and <laughs> that they appreciate the virtual kick in the ass that you just gave them. So I appreciate it as well. I feel like I just got a little like virtual slap, like get your <laughs> get to it, get organized. So I appreciate it so much. You got it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. All right. Pursuing Freedom Friends, as always, thanks for tuning in. Hey, before I always end with the ask for the review, because you know that the reviews help us attract these amazing guests. But first and foremost, I do want to share that these these ideas that Ruben has been highlighting, like time tracking and tracking your activity and who did you call and where did the leads come from, on the website, pursuingfreedom.com forward slash resources, you can find a sample ideal weekly schedule as well as a template you can fill in. You can find a time tracking template, an activity tracker. There's a five-step guide to more referrals. There's so many free resources to help you implement these very simple procedures that are going to liberate you and help you create the life you don't need a vacation from. So I appreciate you. I love you. As always, please find a little pencil and leave a review. Help us help you on your journey to living an extraordinary life. Make it an awesome day. Woo.